In this video, we're focused on a periodic system of inventory. We'll take a look at an example where we purchase merchandise, sell merchandise, and then we'll look at closing entries for a periodic system of inventory as well. This is example 5-5. I've tried to simplify this example in a few different spots, just so the video doesn't run too long. Also with me here today is my dog Luna, so she might chime in from time to time. I do apologize for that. Now would be a good time for you to pause the video and download the spreadsheet and to try this question out yourself. If you've done that already, let's get to it and work through the solution together. This example deals with transactions that we've already seen before throughout module five. The difference in this example is Call Me Again Phones is now using a periodic system of inventory. On June 12th, Call Me Again Phones purchases 10 phones on credit from Best Purchases for $3,000. Credit terms are 210 net 30. As a reminder, that means a 2% discount is given for payment within 10 days. Otherwise, the net amount is due within 30 days. The way this is recorded is instead of a debit to inventory, we debit an account called purchases for $3,000. We then credit accounts payable as per usual for $3,000. We'll keep track of a few accounts again via T accounts, which I like to do, but not required for you to do based on the way the question was worded. On June 14th, Call Me Again Phones pays best purchases in full for the June 12th purchase. So the account payable of $3,000 will be settled, debit accounts payable $3,000. This is paid within the discount period, so we will credit purchase discounts, which is the amount $3,000 multiplied by the discount percentage, 2%, credit purchase discounts for a total of $60. Then we credit cash for the difference, which is $2,940. Taking a look at our accounts, we can see that purchases still sits at 3,000. Accounts payable is now settled for the time being and purchase discounts is at $60. On June 18th, Call Me Again Phones purchases 20 phones on credit from FutureCart for $6,000. The credit terms are 215 net 30. Once again, we will debit purchases instead of inventory because this is a periodic system and we will credit accounts payable for the obligation. Updating our accounts, we can see that purchases has gone up to $9,000 and accounts payable, which was previously at zero, is now up to 6,000. On June 20th, Call Me Again Phones returned five of the phones purchased from FutureCart. FutureCart accepts the returns the phones were returned for their selling price, $300 each. This would be FutureCart selling price to Call Me Again phones of $300. If that is the case, we'll reduce our payable. If we have returned something, we no longer expect to pay for it. So $300 a unit times five units is $1,500. And we will credit purchase returns and allowances for $1,500. Ask yourself, what would that have been if this was a perpetual system? If you answered credit inventory, you would be correct. Updating the accounts, we can see that accounts payable is now reduced by $1,500 and sits at $4,500. And purchase returns and allowances is now sitting at $1,500. That is a normal credit balance account. Moving on to June 22nd, Call Me Again Phones pays FutureCart for the outstanding balance on their June 18th purchase. So we debit accounts payable, the amount that was owing for $4,500, but we should also take advantage here since they did take advantage of paying within the discount period, we should recognize the discount, $4,500 multiplied by the discount percentage is 2% and totals $90. So credit purchase discounts of $90. The difference will be what we pay in cash, credit cash, $4,400 and $10. Updating some of the accounts that we're tracking. Accounts payable is now at zero. Purchase discounts is now at $150. 
On June 24th, Call Me Again Phones purchases eight phones on credit from Best Purchases for $2,400. The credit terms are 210 net 30. Best Purchases has shifted to FOB shifting point. Shipping point. Freight costs are $35 and are charged by Best Purchases. So because the inventory is bought from a supplier called Best Purchases and freight is charged by the same supplier, Best Purchases, we can assume that that is all likely charged on the same invoice. So we can debit purchases for $2,400, debit freight in for $35, and that differs from a perpetual system, right? A perpetual system, all of that would have gone to one account called inventory. Here it's tracked separately. And then we can credit accounts payable for the entire amount since it's all from the same supplier, $2,435. Now we see purchases is up all the way to $11,400. Freight in is introduced here and is up to $35. And accounts payable is at $2,435. Requirement two asks us to calculate the cost of goods sold for June. A physical count of inventory revealed inventory on hand of $9,785. Currently on the screen is a check figure. Cost of goods sold is zero. This should not be a surprise to you. In the month of June, the business we are doing the accounting for, Call Me Again Phones, didn't sell anything. Still, we can do a calculation. Beginning inventory in this example was assumed to be zero. That's one of the simplifications that I made. Purchases was 11,400. Purchase discounts is 150 and purchase returns and allowances was 1500. If we take our beginning inventory, add our net purchases throughout the period, we will have, and then add freight in, we will arrive at something called the COGAS or the cost of goods available for sale. This is the cost of goods that are available for sale throughout the period in which we are doing the accounting for. If we subtract what's left over, the difference will be whatever was sold. In this case, since ending inventory just happens to be equal to the COGAS, that would imply that nothing was sold during the period. And that's correct. We went through all of the transactions and saw that they did not make any sales in the month of June. Requirement three asks us to record closing entries for the month of June based solely on the entries in requirement one. So we can do this in a few ways. One way that I like to do it is to close the revenue accounts first. So to do that, it's pretty easy for this example. There were no revenue transactions in the period. Again, that's another simplification for video runtime. Let's take a look at the expense accounts. There were no expenses in the month of June that were listed anyways in the transactions that we were given. Still, there's some things we can do with respect to inventory. We can deal with the inventory accounts. So what that means is we can close purchase discounts and purchase returns and allowances. These are normal credit balances, so they are closed with a debit. We can also close freight in and purchases. These are normal debit balances and they are closed with a credit. The difference goes to income summary, $9,785. This represents our net purchases plus freight in. So if we look at income summary, all that's really in it is that amount, net purchases plus freight in. Then again, at the end here with the periodic system, we're supposed to update the inventory accounts. And we do that by closing beginning inventory to income summary. That will be very easy for us to do because there was no beginning inventory. And then ending inventory to income summary. And we did have a balance for that. So beginning inventory was zero in this example, so there's nothing to close. But we did know, we did an inventory count and at the end we counted $9,785 worth of ending inventory and that can be put onto the balance sheet and that amount gets put or offset to income summary. So in this 
abbreviated example, income summary ends up being zero just after this step. However, what you're more likely to see in income summary is something like this, had this been a full out example. Under income summary, you would expect to close revenues to income summary. And then your beginning inventory, your net purchases, and your freight in. You would also close ending inventory and your remaining expenses. And depending on whether you had a credit balance left over or a debit balance left over, you would either have a net loss or net income. If we take a look at this T account here, one thing to think about is that beginning inventory plus net purchases plus freight in subtract ending inventory. Well, that is effectively your cost of goods sold. So your revenues on this side, your cost of goods sold will end up in totality being on this debit side with your other expenses. The difference would be net income or net loss. Requirement four is to record entries for the month of July. Remember, we're using a periodic system for these sales transactions. They're gonna look pretty similar with one key difference. Let's look at July 3rd. Call Me Again Phone sells two phones to Anchor Farm on credit terms for a total of $1,000. Credit terms are 210 net 30. So we can debit accounts receivable for $1,000 and credit sales revenue for $1,000. In a perpetual system, we would have another entry that follows this. We would recognize the cost of goods sold and we would remove these phones from inventory, a credit to inventory. That does not happen in a periodic system because we will only do all of the accounting for inventory at the end of the period. So updating some accounts here, accounts receivable sits at $1,000 after this and sales revenue $1,000 after this transaction. On July 7th, Anchor Farm pays for their July 3rd purchase in full. So we'll debit cash, but the question is how much to debit cash for? Well, we know we're settling the account receivable of $1,000, and this is on July 7th, so within the discount period. So sales discounts will be 1,000 times 2%, the discount percentage, or $20. The difference will be the cash received, 980. Updating some accounts, we can see that accounts receivable now sits at zero and sales discounts is now at $20, previously zero. On July 10th, Call Me Again Phones sells five phones to Shelly Wines on credit for $2,500. Credit terms are 210, net 30. So we debit accounts receivable, $2,500, credit sales revenue, $2,500. Again, this being a periodic system, there's no secondary entry. We will not debit cost of goods sold and we will not credit inventory because this is a periodic system. Updating the accounts, we can see that accounts receivable now sits at 2,500 and sales revenue is now up to 3,500 in total for the month. On July 12th, Shelly Wines provided evidence that one of the phones was slightly damaged, but still usable. Instead of returning the phone, Shelly Wines agreed to accept a $50 allowance. So we debit sales returns and allowances for $50, and we credit accounts receivable for $50. Taking a look at the accounts, we can see that accounts receivable goes down by $50 because that amount is no longer receivable. We've told the customer they don't need to pay at least $50 because of the damaged phone. And sales returns and allowances is now at $50, keeping track of that. On July 14th, Shelly Wines had one employee leave their company and didn't use or need one of the phones. Shelly Wines returns one of the phones as a result. The phone is in perfect condition and is placed back into inventory for future resale. So we will debit sales returns and allowances to track the return and we'll credit accounts receivable $500 because this amount is no longer receivable from the customer. In a perpetual system, you would have a secondary entry here that would put the phone back into inventory at our cost 
and also reduce the cost of goods sold. Again, here we are dealing with a periodic system, so no such entry would exist. Updating the accounts, we can see accounts receivable goes down by $500 to $1,950, and sales returns and allowances goes up by $500 to $550. On July 17th, Shelley Wines pays the outstanding balance from their July 10th purchase in full. So the amount that was outstanding we saw earlier was $1,950. We're not using subsidiary ledgers in this example, I'm ignoring them for now, but we do know having gone through the transactions that that amount, $1,950, relates solely to Shelley Wines at this point in time. So that is the amount outstanding. Shelley Wines pays it all, so we are going to credit accounts receivable for $1,950, but we have to calculate the sales discount as well. So debit sales discount, $1,950 times 2%, the discount percentage, because we are within the discount period, that's $39. So the cash received is $1,911. Some of you might try to figure out the cash just by taking 1,950 and multiplying it by 98%. That'll get you pretty close too. Updating some of our accounts. Accounts receivable is now at zero. Sales discounts is up to $59. And those are the only accounts that we're keeping track of here that were impacted. Moving on to requirement five to calculate the cost of goods sold for the month of July. A physical count of inventory revealed inventory on hand of $8,009. Regardless of whether you have a perpetual or a periodic system of inventory, the business will be doing uh, regular counts of physical inventory. With a periodic system, it is absolutely necessary to do. So we've looked at this equation before. Beginning inventory for this month, July, is equal to ending inventory of the prior month, June, so it's $9,785. Keeping things simple in this example, there were no purchases made during the month, so no freight in either to deal with. So the cost of goods available for sale is $9,785. If we subtract the ending inventory of $8,009, the cost of goods sold is $1,700 and $76.